rest of our next All right. Okay. So we'll get started. Yes. Very good. Okay. Seven o'clock. This goes about an hour and a half. Um, and since this is a Bible study, it's interactive like last week, you know, of course. And before we start, we're going to cover chapter two. Um, I'd like to cover two and three tonight if I can due to time. But if we get to three, great. If not, then I'll... I'll, uh, I'll make sure that we get to at least two chapters next week so we can start picking up a little bit more. Again, um, just to reiterate, if we don't get through all the chapters that are listed in the bulletin, which are the first 10 chapters, which we won't, we can jump, right? I mean, if there's, I'll take consensus to say, if you want to do chapter by chapter, I think the first three are critical, but if you want to do chapter by chapter, that's fine until we get five chapters or six chapters or whatever it is. Or if you want to go to Noah's Flood in Chapter 9, we can do that. You know, we'll, we'll play it by ear and see what we get. Um, I probably should have thought a little bit better when I was <coughs> planning this out by saying instead of the first 10 chapters, I probably should just say five chapters, and then we'll take it from there. But we'll get to where we can. So we'll begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Most Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. For your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We ask you to open up our hearts and minds as we study your word, especially the beginnings, the book of Genesis. We ask you, Lord, to let your word inflame our hearts and enkindle that fire within us to cause growth in us, to go deeper, to be transformed by your word, especially during this Lent. We ask for the Holy Spirit to enlighten our minds and hearts as we call upon him, as we pray. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful. And kindle within us the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, and we shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Mary, seat of wisdom, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'd like to open with a psalm, actually. Sounds weird, doesn't it? But Psalm 19, I, I came across this in the office readings the other day, and I thought it was very pertinent to what we've been studying and it's not the whole chapter, but it's Psalm 19, like chapters 1 through 7. If you have your Bibles, you can, you can follow along. If not, you can just listen. No, no problem at all. That's so, good. Yeah. Yes, you got yours. You're hey, studious. Hey. Yeah. You, know, you got to come prepared, say. right? All right. Very good. And a lot of times, Bibles are on your phones as well, right? So that's a, you know, go to BibleGateway.com. Boom, you're there. You could pick whatever translation you want. So Psalm 19 says this, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices like a strong man to run its race. Its rising is from one end of the heaven and its circuit to the other end, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. And I just, that struck me because as we studied chapter one last week, we talked about the firmaments, we talked about the heavens, and what are they doing? They're declaring the glory of God, right? The St. Thomas Aquinas said it's an exodus out of God's uh, love out of his benevolence. Creation is that exodus which man, through the virtue of religion, which is due to that, which is due to God alone, brings back the reditus to God. So it's just like your heart. Pumps out the blood, purifies your body, and comes back to it. So God exodus out his love and his creation and all of creation are to return, to reditus that love back to God. And this was doing, and it's all for his doxa, all for his glory. So I want to begin there. Now today we're going to start chapter two. And if you don't mind, since you were such a good reader last time and your voice showed up or, or came up so clear on the recording, I'll have you do it again. That's all right. So... Chapter 2, the whole chapter, and then we'll, we'll get some thoughts and, and break it down. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God finished his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. 
So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it God rested from all his work, which he had done in creation. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, when no plant of the field was yet in the earth, and no herb of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was no man to till the ground, but a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is Pison. It is the one which flows around the whole land of Hadala, when there is where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. Delium and onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is Gihon. It is the one which flows around the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall die. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. So out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air, and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all cattle, and to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for the man there was not a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This is at last bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man leaves his father and his mother and clings to his wife, and they become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked, and we're not ashamed. Thank you. So we see chapter two is talking about creation. It starts with some of the creation as chapter one did. But some people say that there's two different accounts of creation. What a lot of the scholars teach is actually there's one account of creation from two perspectives. The first that we covered last week is God. In the beginning, God created. And by the way, the Hebrew drops the ha, which is the, and it says in beginning. So chapter one, we only have one, well, actually we have three persons, right? The blessed, and active at that creation. So there's no humans on the earth yet. So that perspective is from God. Now chapter two, we're going to see man coming on, right? So chapter two picks up from chapter one of creation, but when God forms the man, then we start to see the perspective of his own creation from Adam's point of view. So chapter two devotes most of its content to man, right? To, to the creation of man, the garden where he's putting them. I want to just read a catechism quote. It said, God created man out of love and also calls him to love in the fundamental and innate vocation. For man is created in the image and likeness of God, who himself is love. Since God created him, man and woman, their mutual love becomes an image of an absolute and unfailing love with which God loves. So, so it's all partaking in God's love. That's where it originates, because God is love. So it originates from him. And then God said, it is good, very good, actually, he uses that phrase. And he says, this love of God is blessed and intended to be fruitful, and to be realized in the common work of watching over creation. Now we're gonna get into this, of what this work is, and what the word usage is there that God is asking Adam to do. So God blesses them, and he says, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. So let's just break it right down here. 
Heavens and the earth are finished. God is forming man. Now, what's interesting is the formation of man is a fashion, right? So God is fashioning him instead of just speaking him into existence like he did the others, right? The fish of the sea, let there be, you know, birds of the air and fish of the sea, let there be and there was. Man, he didn't say let there be and there he is, right? He fashioned. Why do you think that is? Why do you think that God fashioned man instead of just spoke him straight into being? Do you know what I mean by fashioned? He took the dust of the earth, right, and fashioned him. Well, he fashioned because man is his masterpiece, right? And it's like a master potter. That's where you get the term potter and the clay, the potter's fashioning his beautiful creation, right? Saying this one is why who I am making everything for. All the earth is made for man, right? Take dominion over everything. So God is fashioning as an image of a master taking his delicate time for his masterpiece. And we see that Adam was fashioned from the ground and that God blew into his nostrils the breath of life. Now, some of your your translations are different, right? Some of your translations, and that's fine, but they all pretty much say the same thing. He blew blew the breath of of life into him, and that breath is neshama, which is in Hebrew literally means he teaches us how to breathe, right? That's also where we get the word Yahweh from, Yahweh, right? It's It's that breath. And the breath of life phrase is nishimat shaim. And remember last week, we talked about a similar sounding word called maim. And maim is waters. And from thence on, man will be in the waters, so to speak, of the womb, right? And getting the breath of life from God, nishimat shayim. And of course, nefesh is the soul. So God gives him a soul. So that ruach, that, that, that creation, the neshima blowing the breath into his, li- into his lungs into, to give him life, is that indication of soul, right? Blowing the breath of life, giving them the soul. Now, some have said that, or just assumed, maybe that Adam was created in the garden. But actually, we read he wasn't. He read, we'll read that he was placed in the garden. Again, it's a reference to last week, what we talked about with the test, remember? Some of you who weren't here, we talked about God putting the angels to a test, and the and now this isn't doctrine or the church or any this is this is a teaching this is a, a a nice held theological concept and teaching of the church that God put the angels to the test about him becoming man God becoming lower than the angels especially through a virgin and of course the angels how would they react to that and they had a one time test why do angels only choose one time and then after that they're forever locked in their state of that decision whereas us we're not. We can decide one day for God, and then the next day we fall into sin, and we don't decide for God, and then we repent, we come back to him, and our whole life is like that, right? Up and down, thanks be to God, we have those chances, always, until the end of our life. But why is it that the angels did not? Because they knew immediately the consequences that's, of that's their right. choice. So they could see, they're not all omniscient, right? God knowing everything completely, but they could see the end result of what they chose from the beginning. So they could see all the damage that what something they would choose, if they chose wrong, would do, and what the end result would be. They're, they're privy in their mindset like that, right? So they could see that, but they still chose it. So they're locked, right? We don't see the end of what we do. Uh, half the time, we can't even see three foot in front of us. What, what I just, well, I'm sorry, I offended you. I didn't mean to do that, you know? So we're like, oh. So because of that, you know, man, these are the things angels desire to look into, scriptures say, right? Because they're, they're ministering spirits sent forth the minister for us. But that's what happened in the fall. So they weren't created, according to uh, a lot of the theologians, in the beatific vision of heaven, but they were created in the paradise. And we talked about this, how the church, you know, so man is not created in the paradise of the garden, right? but created outside it, placed in there by God. And it says it right in the scriptures, right? God placed Adam in the garden. St. Thomas Aquinas explains this, right? He says that this was the case to show that Adam was not supernatural like God. He wasn't God. He was God's creation. 
He was given supernatural grace. That is when he was put in the garden. Once in the garden, Adam is commanded to tend and to keep it. Now this is very interesting. Because that word in the Hebrew for keep is guard. It's shamar. And it means to guard it. So don't just work it. Just don't keep it nice and neat and tidy, right? Guard it. But what did he have to guard it from? What was on the earth at that time? Remember we talked about this last week. What had happened? There was somebody, there was a nefarious entity waiting in there, right? To mess things up, to foil things up, to foil God's plan because he lost that, that battle in heaven. He lost that vision. He lost that. Right. So he comes as a serpent, right? He's cast onto the earth. And that word serpent, again, you remember from last week? Okay. The word serpent, hash, but there's also another serpent called Tanin. So the serpent, the Nahash, the serpent is Nahash. Yeah, okay. that's a that's serpent in, in Hebrew. And then there's then there's Tanin, which is also a Hebrew word for serpent, meaning the sea, right? Or the serpent of the sea. So this this guarding is he's guarding it from us. So got, he's told to guard it. But we're going to see in chapter three that he did not guard it well. So that guarding is because of the forthcoming temptation that would be from the devil, right? From, from, you know, Lucifer, who's a fallen one, right? By the way, the word diabolic, you know, uh, diabolo, devil, do you know what that means? Do you know what the word devil means? To divide. That's what, that's what the, the word devil literally means to divide. And that's what he does, right? He divides and conquers, he divides. The word Satan, you know what that means? The word Satan means accuser. So the devil divides your attention from God, and then when you fall in sin, he accuses you, see? Whereas God, when you sin, becomes your friend. We, we look at it backwards. We run from God when we sin. Ah, oh, I just did a terrible thing. Oh, God's going to kill me. He's going to put me to death. And the devil seems like, well, you know. But it's the opposite way around. The devil becomes your friend before you sin, and your enemy after you sin, and God becomes your friend after you sin, not your enemy before, but your enemy. Mm -hmm. That Satan's always your enemy, but he comes as that angel of light, as that befriending. And that's how he gets you, right? And that's how he got Eve and Adam, and we're going to see that in a little bit. <coughs> so when Adam's created here, and it goes on to say, he planted the garden, and out of the ground, the Lord God made every tree grow that's pleasant to the sight of food. Now, now this is what's awesome about God. He, every tree grow. And he gave him access, right, to, to every, every tree. But there's only this one tree that we're going to read about that he doesn't give him access to. And we're not there yet. But every tree, he says, that he formed, and he's got the rivers, right, that, that are flowing. Mm -hmm. And the Lord God commanded man to say, out of every tree of the garden you may eat. Now, isn't that benevolent? Isn't that wonderful? Every tree, bah, guess what, right? There's one, right? There's one that you may not eat of it. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. Now, like any four-year-old, five-year-old, right? You can play with anything, but don't play with this. What do you think they're going to go to? That, right? Because you said not to play with that. But I think, to be honest with you, Adam and Eve knew that. And they were staying away from it, my personal opinion, until the Nahash, until the serpent, till that tempter, till the one that comes in and tries to divide, starts to tempt them this way, right? Why would God just keep this one from you? Why would he tell you to leave everything but, but this one? That doesn't make sense, right? I mean, we're going to get there, right? He's going to start playing mind games on, on Eve. Yes? What's the significance of the tree of life in here? Yes. Good question, yep. So the tree of life is has fruit as well as the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the tree of life is eternal. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil is that tree which we decide we don't eat of because as soon as we do, we're going to have that knowledge, that gnosis to say we're going to be gods ourselves and we're going to, you know. But the tree of life is eternal, meaning that if they were to eat from the tree of life before their test or 
worse yet, after their fall, after they failed, failed, failed the test, they would be forever locked in a state of mortal sin and damnation like the angels would. Because the tree of life is just that. Life here doesn't mean a temporal life. It means eternal life. And the tree of life is going to signify the wood of the cross, the tree of life of Christ. We're going to get there and talk about that. Only Jesus offers that tree of life to us, right? So that when we can have eternal life in a redemptive state. But it was placed there. It was placed there in the garden. But they were allowed to eat from that. No, no. So they, yeah, they were allowed to eat from it in the beginning. Yeah. Correct. But, but after they sinned, what happened? He cast them out of God. They were guarding that tree no longer. But they chose not to. They chose to go after the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Yes. Yes. What would have happened, I think, what would have happened, even though we don't see this here, if they did eat of that tree before they sinned? They would have been in the state of life, of eternal life, right? I mean, this is, this is the conclusion I would make because that is the tree of eternal life. This makes sense of why, when they fell, that the cherubims were placed to guard it, to not let them access to it. Because state of mortal sin means you're going to be locked in that state. But they didn't choose that tree. You could eat of any tree. Ooh, there's that tree. Why don't you? This is the one you want to eat? No, no. Got to go after the one they're forbidden, right? And so that, that is what they, they actually do in chapter 3. That's what they do. But uh, so we see that this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of it. The Lord's given him that command. And then right after that, the Lord says this. He says, it's not good that man should be alone, right? But I should make him a helper comparable to him. Now, here's where the interesting comes into play. When he makes Eve, right, he gives Adam. First of all, he brings all the, 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 the cattle and the beasts to Adam, right? To name them. You know, he's telling them, name them. In other words, take the minion, you can name them. But he's also sort of, we're going to see what Adam does here, you know. This is my perspective, right? Is he going to find a suitable help me? He's going to be lonely. It's not good for man to be alone. Let's bring him over to cattle. And what does he do? He looks at him, every beast. Went. For Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. So he comes to a sense of, this is not like me. I am different. Yeah, because you're made in the image and likeness of God. You have reason. You have intellect. The animals don't have that, right? You have an immortal soul which means one that lives forever. So what does God do? He causes a deep sleep to fall on Adam. Now, before I get to this whole theology of Eve and, and, and the uh, theology of the bride coming from his side, I want to talk about Adam, the word Adam. I want to just, just go over that. So Adam, this is what's very interesting here. Adam is a Hebrew word which... The Hebrew, if you look at the Hebrew word, they had consonants. They, they left the vowels out. You ever notice? You ever see G dash D in, in Hebrew writing? Because they won't pronounce God. They won't have that. Okay. So Adam is actually a dash D dash M, right? Which means a red, ready, fair, handsome, male, but also coming from Dom meaning blood. So the word in Hebrew for blood is dam. So Adam is blood. The life of blood flows through Adam. And he was made from Adama, which is the ground, right? Adam is the earth. And the Adama here, the earth, was not tainted or corrupted by sin. Remember, because we read last week in the book of Romans where St. Paul said that all creation groans is eagerly waiting for the redemption, right? So the whole cosmos was affected with original sin, which we'll get to in chapter 3. But because there's no original sin yet on the earth, what was happening is that the earth was virginal. There was no, there was, it, it was, it was spring, the springs were coming forth on its own, watering the earth. There was no uh, taint of decay or soilness or disease or anything like that in the earth. So Adama is virginal. That's what I'm trying to get at. Okay, Adama is virginal. It's virgin pure. Now, when we see that God put this deep sleep, right, over him, out he forms from his side. And the Hebrew word for side is tetzla, not, not tesla. Tetzla, or the Z there, right? Which is actually, they, they, they render that word as rib, 
but it's sigh, coming from a sigh. Now, here's the beauty that all the church fathers say, a lot, most of the church fathers. As Adam was cast into the deep sleep, and out of his side came his bride, so too Christ, the new Adam, was cast into the deep sleep of death, and out of his side, when they pierced it, the blood and water came his bride. And the blood and the water are what? Symbols of the church. What are the symbols? Baptism and Eucharist, which sustains us and feeds us. That's his bride, the church, right? So out of his side. So this is the typology which we see in this chapter from the Adam to the new Adam. But just as there was an old Adam, or a first Adam, and there's a new Adam, so too there's going to be a new Eve. We're going to get to her. But before we get to the new Eve, let's talk about the first Eve. So God fashions her. And he brings her to her. Now, look at that imagery. Isn't this beautiful? Verse 22. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. What happens at a wedding? What happens at a wedding? The father brings his daughter to the bridegroom. Can't you see this image of God the father being the father, escorting his daughter, so to speak? You know, this is all, of course, uh, romantic language, you know. But, but look at it in theological terms. He's bringing his daughter to a wedding. He's marrying Adam and Eve. So God brought her to him, right? Like you would in a wedding. Like, so the two can become one flesh. So the wedding, right, two become one flesh. So too, here, Adam and Eve are literally that one flesh because she was taken from the side. But God the Father is escorting her like at a wedding, bringing her to the man, and what does he say? This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, for she shall be called a woman because she was taken from a man. Now, I want to read you something in the Hebrew. I'm not going to read it in Hebrew. First, I don't know how to read Hebrew. <laughs> but I'm going to read what the Hebrew words are. And then this was a great writing. This was put together um, by a, uh, a biblical guy named Louis Turberg. And he says that the word ish, I-S-H, is male, biological male. And the word isha, I-S-H-H, is female. Do you know that Adam, that word, Adam, yes, it means ruddy, you know, red, blood, but the original connotation of that was human. Human. Here's where it gets tricky. And don't get lost here, don't get confused. But here's where it gets tricky. The maleness, right? He was always male. We know that. But the maleness of the man, the word man, came to be once the woman identified, once the woman is the one that defined it. You see what I mean? So man wasn't fully man until the woman came from his side. He was referred to as human. And listen to this. When Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. The creation here has many profound things to say. We can be enriched just by looking at the Hebrew words ish and isha. So it may surprise English readers that the word Adam is a neutral term, meaning human, not specifically a man at that point. In the original Hebrew, all references to Adam are neutral until God takes some of Adam's flesh, just what I said, and makes the woman isha. And at that point, it's fully defined as man. The ish is man, the Hebrew isha, hints at her origins from within the ish, right? Something that we can sort of look at and mimic in the English of man and woman. So Adam is called ish after, after the, the, the actual, it's rendered as man here, but after the actual taking of his bride from his side. So the complementarity here is between man and woman is inherent in the way that they were taken from each other, from one from the other. What the Isha provides is what the Ish lacks. Does that make sense? What the Ish, what the Isha, the woman provides is what the man, the Ish lacks. It is God's design. It is together, when they're together, that they ultimately reflect the image of God. That's what God said in chapter one. He made them in his image, male and female, he made them, right? So Adam by himself is not fully man. But when the Isha, the woman comes from his side, then the complementarity is that that's what defines them. 
right? And it's the one shall, the two shall become one flesh. And that's the image of marriage here that we get. I hope that doesn't confuse people, but this is beautiful because the other term for helpmate, right? We often read that she became a helpmate for Adam. That actual word is Azar Konegdo in the Hebrew. Azar is Hebrew for savior, savior. Negd is opposite of. Connect is an opposite of. So Azar Connect literally means the Isha, the woman who was born, is the savior that is opposite of the man as a help meet, right? As one who completes and saves. So, so and it's the same with a man and with a woman, right? And I often have said this before, like if Adam was by himself, he's sort of like this hand, right? He can sort of freely just do whatever it wants. And, yeah, but if you have something that's opposite of it, that comes up against it, then they balance each other, and that's what a man and woman do, right? So women are not subservient. Women aren't less than, no, they're both equal in dignity. They have different roles, right? They have definitely have different roles, and God set that up. But they're not, there's no difference in the dignity of how God created them. Matter of fact, he created them from the same, ish, isha, right? The same, which is an azar connecto to the man, which is a help me. And this is what completes the human race, right? This is what completes the human race. And this is um, something when you study Genesis, this is why when you get Genesis wrong in the sense of who we are, it has consequences in our lives, like, you know, identity problems, all sorts of, you know, uh, problems with probably making like, um, not just transgender stuff, but I'm just talking about identity problems with your roles, right? Okay, well, you're, you're, you're less than the dignity of God, you know, you're, you're, you're here to serve the man and so on and so forth. This is a man's world and stuff like that. That's not what God is saying here at all, right? He's saying that I'm making the human race, I'm making them complete through both, through both. He made them both in his image and likeness. And that Azar Konegdo is that Hebrew form that brings that completeness out. So then she, here she is, right? And then it goes on to say, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. One flesh. Now, we see this typology again. And for those who don't know what typology is, a type is something that we can look at here in this Old Testament, right? And say that's a type of, of Christ. That's a type of Mary. That's a type of God or the angels or something, right? A type of the reality of what's in heaven. So this type here that in verse 24, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife is what Christ did for us. He left his father's side, so to speak, to be joined with his bride, to become human, to become incarnate for, with us, right? And there's that marriage taking place, the marriage of God and man. He wants to wed us in humanity. He's our bridegroom. That's why we often refer to God as the bridegroom. That's why the mass is the nuptialness, right? Is the, is the consummation of the nuptial relationship with Christ. We are church. We are the bride of Christ. And, and it's all throughout Scripture, that, that bridal marriage uh, typologies, all throughout Scripture. It starts right here in, in chapter 2. We see it. But here's something interesting. They were naked and without shame. Why would they have to say that? What does that mean, without shame? Well, I'll give you, I'll give you some ideas of what some of the uh, scholars have said about this, but what do you think that means, without, without shame, naked and without shame? Didn't bother them? Didn't know any difference? They had There wasn't any sin. They were just like the animals, <laughs> They knew they weren't being objectified by anybody else. So this, these are all good answers. These are they, no, they're all they're all correct too. I mean, they're all good. I'm not going to say they're not. <laughs> yes, there's no sin, right? Um, there's no objectification going on, right? Um, so without shame, this is what some of the scholars say. Listen to this: When Adam and Eve were naked, God's glory covered them. The beauty of their creation, of who they were, God's glory was over them, so they weren't looking at anything through the lens of concupiscence. Concupiscence is that bent for fallen, you know, for the fallen nature. That bent for, um, uh, you know, sin. The bent toward the, the, the lesser, baser things, right? There, there, there wasn't that. It was an original sin. So their vision and their state of mind and their clarity 
was pristine because they were without sin. So God's glory, they saw the glory of God in each other. That is shisha, see? So they were without, there's no shame there, right? Shame happens when we sin, right? So that's when, when shame comes in, when we sin. So they were naked without shame, but we're gonna now, I'm just gonna, uh, I can get to chapter three, I think, yay. Um, but I, I am going to um, make, a, make a, a little clarification here of what I, from last week. Last week, and this is true, last week, God, when he's talking, it's Elohim, plural, plural. Let us make God in our own image. He's talking about the Trinity, right? Let us make God in our, or let's make God, let's, let's make man in our own image. So that is plural. Now, what does chapter two start to say? The, and the Lord God formed. Verse 7. Now the word Lord is added in there, Yahweh, right? God Almighty, Almighty, uppercase, Lord. So now we're looking at Elohim, Yahweh Elohim, which means now from the standpoint of Adam, Elohim, this is Lord, right? This is the Lord Almighty. I'm not God. I'm separate from this. You know, his creation is not him. He's separate from creation. It's not pantheism. It's not this, you know, this is separate. And so Adam is making note of that by referencing this whole idea. Chapter two is when Adam comes on the scene of bringing up the word Lord, the Lord God, Yahweh, man. And now you're going to see how the responses are going to be. Now, Adam, again, was placed in the garden. That garden's like a temple. The garden was like heaven. It was this temple place. And it was meant for worship as well, right? We see that there's a river which carries precious stones. We see many rivers, four of them, right, right? Such as gold and onyx. The tree of life is there. In the book of Revelation, we see in God's holy temple a similar, very similar thing. Right? We see a river, precious stones there. It says the gates of the stones, right? The tree of life is there for the healing of nations. Right? So everything on earth is a replica of, of the beatific vision of heaven, right? So God created this, manifested this heaven, and that's what Eden Right, that's what this paradise is like. The wedding is there. We have the wedding feast of the Lamb at the end. Right, that's what's going to happen. The wedding feast of the Lamb is going to take place. We have it at Mass, but ultimately at the end of time, we'll be in the banquet, right, of the wedding feast of the great wedding feast of the Lamb. What do we see in Genesis? A wedding taking place. Adam and Eve. Again, again, the Father, the God, the Father is bringing Eve to Adam, and it's like a, the Father walking his precious daughter down the aisle to to to, to wed him to her bridegroom, and we're being wed to the bridegroom of Christ. Then there's the word tav. I just want to finish with this one in this chapter. Tav means good and harmonious relations. God proclaimed all his creational acts is good, tav. But there's one place that God actually says that something's not good, okay? God said it's not good. We just read it. Not good for man to be, for man alone. To be alone. That's right, that's right. Todd, that's where he's saying it's not good for man to be alone. So he made that completeness, right, from her. Um, so the word tav there, if you want to write down any technical notes, you can, you can use that. So the catechism says this on, on, on the bride. And by the way, the word woman was used for Eve before she fell. The word Eve started to play, come into play after she fell. Eve means what? Mother of the living, right? Mother of all the living. But woman is that is that completeness being used. So when our Lord, right, when he comes to Our Lady at the pivotal points of, of, of the New Testament scripture, at the wedding feast of Cana, at the, at, the, at the cross, right, what does he say? He says, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? Woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. He didn't say mom, Mother, Miriam, behold your son. He used the word woman. What do you think is taking place there? He's hearkening back to a pristine state where Eve was in before she was called Eve. She was called woman. Mary was in a pristine state. Mary was without sin. She was conceived without sin in the Immaculate Conception. So thus he refers to her as that prophetic type of, calls her woman, which is what? The one, what Eve was called before she fell. It's beautiful. It's, it's harkening back to as there was two that brought down humanity. There was two that will cooperate, right? That will redeem humanity. Adam and Eve, Jesus and Mary. Right? 
And so this is, this is the beauty of Scripture and how we get into that. So the Catechism says, it's not this one, sorry. That the woman God fashions from man's ribs and brings to him elicits on man a part of a cry of wonder, an exclamation of love and communion. Right? This is at last bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, he says. Man discovers woman as the other eye, sharing the humanity. And that's Catechism 371. And I think it's beautiful because we see that at Mass in a way, right? We are the bride. He's the bridegroom. And even if we're men, we're still the bride of Christ. So how can that be? What does a bride do, right? When, when a bride... So a husband and wife are fecundant, right? They, 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 they produce life. They multiply, right, to bring forth life. That's what, that's, and, and even though some can't because of you know, fallen nature, that doesn't mean they're not husband and wife. But I'm just saying that's what usually they do. So God being the, the groom, the bridegroom, and the church being the bride... A bride receives, the groom initiates, the groom gives. The word of God, I'm going to read you something right here. It's pretty, pretty interesting. From, I think it's from 1 Peter. And this uh, will hopefully you know, bring the point across of what I'm, what I'm trying to say. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22 and 23. It says here, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible seed through what? The word of God. Now the word of God is the seed, right? In the Old Testament, it says this, in the book of Isaiah, it says, as the, the snow comes down and waters the earth and brings fruit and grass, so too does my word go forth. It goes forth, and it does not return to me void, but accomplishes that for which I sent it. So his word is the seed, which is, and that's what Jesus said in the soul and the seed, right? The, the, the soil went out and sowed seed. That word is being sowed. So the tools was, who was the word in the beginning? Jesus. So the man has the seed. The man has the word. The man initiates. A woman receives. The bride receives. So as we come forward in Holy Communion, God initiates his seed of life, his word, into us physically. We receive. But what, would, what does that reception do? It brings us life. We start to develop life like a bride would, right? This is spiritual life that I'm talking. This is life of, of, the, of, of the supernatural faith. And then, of course, at the end of the Mass, it's ite missa s, which ite missa s actually doesn't mean go forth, you're sent. It means it is sent. What is the it in the ite missa s? I'm getting off track here, sorry. But what is the it? It is the word has been sent to the Father. It's been sent. The sacrifice, the oblation has been sent to the Father. Go. Right. Ite missa s, it's been sent. So we see here the bride symbology. We see the bridegroom all with an Adam and Eve, God's developing this, right? Right in the beginning of creation to show us what? Jesus and Mary. Mm -hmm. Man is made in the image and likeness of Christ. Women are made in the image and likeness of Christ as well, but Mary, right, is that role. Father has said this in his homilies. He said Mary is that exemplar, Mm -hmm. right, of which God would create that bride, that, that, that humanity, right? She is the model. She's the stamp, Right? God is the image of, of God. Jesus and Mary are that for us. But they were naked and without shame. God's glory covered them. And that's where they were. They were in the garden, naked, without shame, walking in the cool of the day with God, enjoying God's creation, enjoying what he you know, had, had given them, right? All the plants of the field. The earth. But there looms this one little thing in there that we just was early on in that chapter, and that's this Dreaded tree. What is this tree? Right. And we're going to talk about it. All right. So let's let's get there. And we're going to talk about vows and oaths in this as well. Any questions on chapter two before we hit chapter three? I'm so glad we're able to get to chapter three. I don't know. I'm watching this. Uh, that's only. It's only. Uh, we got time. Plenty of time. Chapter 3.
Ready? Go for it. Now the serpent was more subtle than any other wild creature that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all cattle and above all wild animals. Upon your belly you shall go and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Yet your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree with which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth to you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. You are dust, and to dust you shall return. The man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Thank you. Now, before I pick up that, I wanted to show you this. It's a little bit of humor here. Let's see if this comes on. I hope it, it comes on. It should be Did it turn on? Did it turn on? No. No light. I'm wondering if it's because it's not plugged in well. To turn that? Like, oh, yeah, notice if I turn it on. There you go. Gee. <laughs> okay. There you go. We all have that problem. Why does this work? I, but I have it more than most people. That's the problem. Okay. It's still not. Do that again. Oh, it's it's, it's coming. coming. Yes, yeah, coming. Good. All right. This is this is um something I wanted to uh, show you if it comes up here. HDMI. Yeah. Okay. All right. Ready? This. This is his first attempt to be romantic, right? <laughs> Eve, you're the only one for me, right? Like, yeah. Okay, so we know I know it's corny and stupid. But I, had, I had to do that, just a bit of humor in there, because, you know, this is so deep stuff. But I had it sitting there, and I kept looking over, and I was like, ah, I probably should have shown that earlier. But anyway, so chapter three. Chapter three. So we see a lot going on, right? We see it starts right out with a serpent, right? The serpent, he was cunning, right? He was more cunning than any of the beasts of the field, right? It was just like he's, he's got this, this slyness to him. But you know what? He wasn't crawling. He wasn't like the serpent we see. 
okay? Who was on the ground crawling because he was cursed that way. Cursed on your belly you shall crawl all the days of your life, right? After he tempted. So what do you think this was? The serpent was? <laughs> Interesting, right? Yeah. Interesting, because whenever we picture the snake, and it is true, the snake crawls, and he was a serpent. He was in a house. He was a serpent like a snake. But he didn't crawl in his belly until after. So, with some of the theologians, especially like Scott Hahn, he's a modern theologian, he said he was like a dragon ship, right? Mm-hmm. Who, yes, who, who, and, and the other serpent, uh, Hebrew name is like a crocodile, right? So, so they weren't crawling on their bellies. They were, they were intimidating. They were intimidating. This is, this is what you know, the scholars were saying. So he was also very cunning, okay, um, deceptive. Now, here's the thing. Eve is talking to the serpent. Anybody seen red flags there with that? Yeah, yeah it's right? Red flag, red, red flag, talking to a serpent. Should this thing talk? <laughs> I mean, you know, just think about it, right? I just like, it, it, it's interesting because I never really thought of it that way before because some people have, have looked at Genesis 1 through 3 is like a mythology. You know, there are stories that were put in ancient times. It's not really what happened. You really didn't speak to, a, to the snake. But yeah, that's what the church fathers have said. This is literal. This is literal history, right? This is, this is the genre is historical literal, right? And this is what they say. They, she was speaking to this, to the serpent. Was the snake, was it possessed? Well, here's the thing is what they're saying, is that the, he inhabited the snake, the spirit inhabited the body. If you notice in through the, all, all the um, New Testament, when Jesus is casting out demons, what did the one demon say when he was casting them out? He said, give us permission to enter the pigs, remember? Mm-hmm. And then he did, and off the cliff they went, 2,000 of them, or whatever it was, a legion. A legion is like 6,000. Mm-hmm. So they want to inhabit something. Why do you think the demons want to inhabit something? They can't just freely roam. They want to possess. They want to get into a body or into an object, move it. They want to. They want to inhabit something. Why do you think that is? Because that's how they can communicate with us. I mean, they're they're pure spirits. Mm-hmm. They don't. They're they're non corporeal. So the only way that they can manifest is to inhabit something else. So they can also manifest into your mind, right? Yes. So with yes, thoughts, they, they can, can put thoughts. They, they can't read your mind, but they can. But. Here's the primary thing is what is taught. They like to inhabit corporeal things because they mock our Lord who yes. was incarnate. Yes. So Jesus became incarnate, right? He took on human flesh. He took on matter. This is why the church says matter matters, right? If you look at a lot of some of the Protestant sects and circles, nothing against our brothers and sisters there, but if you look at them, right, they tend to be more of the spiritual plane. They, they, they drop down the deck, you know, the, the, the statues, they drop down the, they don't have the sacraments, maybe they have a couple, right? They don't have all the sacraments. They tend to de-emphasize matter a little bit and say the Holy Spirit is in you, which is okay, I got it, we understand it. But when Jesus became incarnate and took on matter, he redeemed matter, so to speak. In other words, now the matter that was lost in the fall is claimed to God. And so, because he became incarnate to redeem us, all of matter now can become holy and be used for him in that sense. This is why we have crucifixes, we have pictures, we have statues. We have, that's why the sacraments have form and matter. The matter of the Holy Eucharist is the bread, the wine, right? Uh, but it does transform and substantiates, transubstantiates into the body and blood of Christ. Right? Totally gone. Totally converts. There's no consubstantiation. It's trans. It transforms into it. Baptism, water, is the matter. So you get the gist here? Because Christ took on matter and became man, and it's forever sealed in that way, he actually died, right? He, became, he, he wedded humanity, took on The demons want to imitate that. They want to be incarnate as well. So they, they hate God so much that they try to imitate. And as it says, Lucifer comes as, a, as an angel of light, right? We talked about that last week, what this light is and what they do. So we see that now the snake is inhabited, okay? Now you got to understand something. They can't do anything without God allowing it. They can't do anything without God allowing it. So they just can't. I mean, if somebody, if something happens, 
God allows that to happen. We're not told how metaphysically this happened with Satan getting into the snake or, you know, into this, this, this serpent. But it did. And he's there. And he's coming. And Eve is now talking to it, is this point, right? So, not only she talked to it, what do you think she should have done? As soon as that happened, what do you think she probably should have done? Yeah. She was right there. Yeah, yeah. She probably should have said, Adam, wait a minute. Come here. Adam, what's going on here, right? Go look at this. What does she do instead? We read it right there. She just, she talks. She starts dialoguing. Can we dialogue with evil before we get sucked in too long? We can't. We, we just can't. We can't start toying and playing with temptations and evil and stuff because we'll get sucked into it. Eventually we will. Maybe Eve thought she was strong enough to look, oh, this is pretty interesting. I wonder what this is, you know? So she's dialoguing with it and then that begins the downfall. But here's where I want to talk about. Last week I talked about Elohim and Yahweh Elohim, Elohim, right? Elohim is God. God refers to himself in that, in that Elohim sense, God. Because he is Lord. Whereas Adam and Eve, he is their Lord. So it's Yahweh Elohim then. When Eve, is, when, first of all, when that Satan approaches her, the serpent starts talking to her, he does not use Yahweh Elohim. Then the Lord God, your Lord said... He's used God, just God, didn't God, Elohim. She responds not with Lord God, but with God. You know what that's doing according to what the exegesis had told us? It's putting themselves on God's plane instead of under, under him, under subserving under him. Okay, so when he, she starts dialoguing with this, with the serpent, with the evil one, it's only a matter of time, right, before she's going to fall. And we saw that it happened, right? We're just going to read this. What does he start telling her? Now, there's some truths and lies here. Okay, there's some truths and lies I want to go over because there's little halves of everything in here, right? And that's how, that's how the devil gets us. He gets us with truths, with half-truths, right? It's the truth. See, if you think about it, an immoral lifestyle, for instance, we'll just use that, right? Somebody's promiscuous and, you know, uh, or fornicating or doing or whatever they're doing, there's truth into the goodness of that. All right, what I mean by that is there's a purpose. You want to, you know, experience the closeness or, you know, you, you, there, there is a pleasure there. But the problem is, is that it's now becoming on your terms. And we're going to see what happens here instead of on God's terms of where it should be. So Satan uses the pleasantries, the goodness, the truth of something to get our attention, never the evil of it. If he was to appear to you in his malevolence, in his in his you know absolute evilness, then you would see right that uh, you would run right. You would know that because we're made in the image of God, I and mean, most of us would run. Maybe some wouldn't, but he doesn't do that. He comes as an angel of light to give us truth because that's what appeals to the human being: beauty, <coughs> goodness, truth, wanting to be accepted, wanting to be loved, appears to us, and so now he's befriending her. But in actuality, you know what he's doing. He's flirting with her to divide, is the devil, the word devil means to divide. He's dividing the marriage. He's going to divorce Adam and Eve. That's what he's trying to do, right? And he's trying to divorce them from God and from each other. I use this triangle. Look at the triangle, right? A triangle. The f Here's a bride and groom down here. The closer they get to God, naturally they're going to be closer to each other. The further they get away from God, the further they're going to be away from each other. She starts to get away from God, and she's now de facto getting away from Adam. Okay. So and then she's alone. She's caught alone. That's how he gets us a lot of times, alone. Right? That's why we need a community of believers. This is why we need the church. This is why we need mass. This is why we need to come to church. We, can't, we, we need that to be in the presence. Right? We can't go this alone. The devil will have us if we do. So what happens? He starts lying to her. He says, you know what? Has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? That question was posed in such a way that he places, automatically places doubt in her heart. Did not God say? <coughs> and what did she say? What did she say? She said, oh, well, God has indeed said that, but he, she adds something there, right? You shall not eat it, or you shall touch it, lest you die. Did God say not to touch it? He didn't say anything about touching. He said, you shall not eat of it, right? 
So she's automatically inferring something into the command that's, that's just not there, right? It's just not there. So the devil has her here. Oh, here, twist him here, twist him the word. Okay, all right, I'll keep going with this, the devil's saying, right? We like this, right? <laughs> By the way, for those of you who weren't here, why is this whole thing playing out to begin with? I'm just going to go back to the test, all right? I'm sorry if I'm repeating this for you who, people who were here last week, but for those who weren't, that fall in heaven was over the Virgin Mary, right, and over Jesus, right, being lower than, than Satan, because on the angelic spirits, there's, there's, so, there's such a spiritual realm that with such high intellect and such um, glorious state that man is lower than the angels in nature, right? So if God became lower, that would mean Lucifer would have to worship something lower than himself, and he's not going to do that because he thinks so highly of himself, right? So he rebels. So here we are, right? This woman caused him to rebel because he was showing the vision of a man, God, becoming man through a virgin, through a woman. So now he's mad at this woman. So he doesn't pounce on Eve, or on Adam, when he's there in the garden. He waits till the woman comes. That's what I lost to in heaven. That's the vision I lost to. I'm going to go after this woman now, and I'm going to foil God's plans because he said that he would come through a woman. And if that's the woman, and I can get her under my domain, then that God who comes to her will be under my domain because he's a strict legalist. Saying this, right? All right. So what's happening? He's going on with his, with his dialogue with her. And what does he say to her? He says, hmm, you won't surely die. Now there's truth to that. There's some truth. What do you think that truth is? Well, they didn't die immediately. They didn't die immediately. That's who she ate. Well, I didn't die. You're right. right. But it kicked off the death process, and she died immediately, spiritually. Immediately. Right, so it says, "In the day you shall eat of it, not only won't you die, but in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you'll be like God, knowing good from evil." Now, I used to think to myself, "What's wrong with that?" In a way, shouldn't they know what the difference is between good and evil? Wouldn't God? Why would God want to keep from them what the difference is between good and evil? It's not what it's saying. It's not we know it's saying. experience. It's not only yada, which yada is the Hebrew word to experience and to, to know. That's the word it means to know. But the word know, yada, is intimate experience, like a spousal relationship, okay? So it's not only yada to experience it. It is to define it. It is to, to come up with good and evil yourself. I will determine what is good and evil. That's what, what's happening here. As soon as you eat it, you'll know good and evil. Not know the difference. You'll know it. You'll be the ones to say, God, you don't have to tell me what's good and bad. I'll make that decision myself. And don't we do that today? Don't we do that today? A lot of times we'll think it's good. So is he saying, you know, good and evil wasn't in the apple. It was in the understanding that you disobeyed. All right, so the good and evil, right? The good and evil was in the act, right, of disobeying, of disobeying. The good and evil was in the act of disobeying. So when they disobeyed, that's when all the stuff happened, right? They couldn't even listen to the command of God. Because what does disobedience, what is that saying? What is disobeying saying? Even in little things, what's it saying? It's saying, I want to be independent from God, my creator, my God. And God doesn't want us to be independent from him. We can't be independent from him, technically. We can't, right? Matter of fact, the book of Hebrews says that he hold, upholds all things by the word of his power. This is Christ, who was made in the exact representation representation of God. He upholds all things by the word of his power. In other words, if he stopped thinking of you, and you were just for one nanosecond independent of him, you would just evaporate, right? So we can't be independent. But this is what Eve is saying by disobeying, because disobedience says, I'm not going to obey what you said. I want to be independent. Not fully independent. I want to come back to you, but in this area. We can't surrender any areas of disobedience or, you know, to God. We can't surrender any of our areas apart from him is what I'm trying to say. So that act, that act of Eden started that downfall. And what does Satan continue to say? Well, before she actually partook, she looked at it. The tree was desirable. Looked good. Hey, what's wrong with this, right? It was desirable to what? Make one wise. That's what it says. Make one wise. So it wasn't so much the, hey, I'm hungry. This is a good looking, delicious fruit. <laughs> it was desirable to make her wise. So the pride is kicking up. Satan's pride is now tempting her with pride. And all of a sudden, she partakes. She eats. And then what happens? She God gives to her husband. 
and he also eats. Can we go back a little? Yep. A uh, little question. This may be a dumb question, but I'll still ask you. Hmm. Um, so when it says, so when the women saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes, does that mean she waited for the food to be good? Or she oh, no, no. immediately saw that? She immediately, she, she immediately. So as soon as that doubt was implanted in her head, the, 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 the hamster started rolling, right? In her head, boom, boom. And immediately she was like, oh, that, that's desirous. I didn't know if the food had ripened first. No, no. So it was desirous to make one wise, right? So she wanted to be wise. So her wisdom came from God. God created her, right? In her, in her intellect, her mind, her wisdom. He created her in that pristine state. But he also gave them free will. And he also gave them free will. Here's the other thing, right? So it's got to be that way. People say, oh, you know, who's the one? Well, St. Augustine was it? Maybe you can correct me. It says, oh, happy fault. Is that Augustine? Anyways. Okay. You know, that's from the, it's from the Easter Vigil Liturgy. Right. It's from the, correct. It's correct. Liturgy. It's from the Easter Vigil Liturgy, which says that all happy fall. Well, what that means, but I think Augustine said, what it means, I could be wrong, but what it means is that this is such a disastrous thing that happened. But thank God, because out of that came redemption, right? Out of this came, it, was, it ended up being Christ conquered death. He's victorious over the evil one. He redeemed us, you know. And, and because of that, we can be happy. It's a happy fault, right? So, so I know it sounds like an oxymoron there, but it's true. It's a whole happy fault. And this is what's happening is that she partook to make herself wise and to be independent of God. And as soon as she did that, what happened? Her eyes were opened. Her eyes were opened, right? Matter of fact, she gave her husband. His eyes were open too. But you know something? What do you think would have happened if she ate and did not? And, and Adam said, no, nope, I'm not going to take that. You shouldn't have done that, Eve. Shame on you. Would you think we'd be in a state we're in today? Yeah, I don't think so. Nope. Nope. We would not be. We would be without sin. There would be no original sin, no death, no disease, anything. We'd live forever? If, if Adam did not partake. We'd be living in a perfect that. world. Because, again, Adam is made in the image and likeness of God, and it is the man who passes that seed who passes the multiplication of life, of sin, of human death. It's in that. It's in... So Jesus, right, does not have a human father because of sin, and he's the one that's sinful. But Mary did, but God intervened, right, at the moment of her conception with that express singular privilege, right, of the immaculate conception. Okay. So the sin comes from that seed. From the, that's why in the Bible too it also says the line of David, the seed of David, Jesus is born of the flesh of David. Um, it's the man, right, that they're trying to keep the patriarchal line through. So if Eve would have, and plus the woman is supposed to be under the head, okay? Okay, women are under the head, meaning that men are the head and women are the heart. You may not like it, but it's true. <laughs> so <laughs> women are, so, so women are the heart. Well, don't get me wrong here. Here we go with the Azar Kedigdo. I want to talk about this a bit, right? Man's the head, when is the heart? Who is the highest creature? Human. Human person. Mary. Created. It was a female. It was Mary. Because Jesus was a divine person. Jesus was a divine person. He was human. Fully human. Fully man. Fully God. That's called the hypostasis. It's called a hypostatic union. But Mary is the human person created. It represents all of humanity. And she's the highest, so a female is technically the highest. But the man is the head. So she submitted under Joseph, okay, when Joseph was to lead her in the desert. And the angel Gabriel came to him and said, Joseph, take your family, flee to the desert. She listened to him. She didn't fight back. and said, Joseph, what are you doing? You know, blah, blah. No, no, she submitted under because man is the head. And this is the way it was with Adam and Eve, right? He was the head, which meant that he doesn't rule the rules nonchalantly and just say, do whatever I say. It's not that at all, Okay. It is that Azar Konegdo, and she's the heart. And because of this role being the head, he had the responsibility. Think of it in a job, right? I mean, in a way, think of it in a job. I know it's not a good analogy, but something I can think of. You have a supervisor or manager. He's taking responsibility for his people that are under him, right? So if one of these guys messes up, the bigwigs will come to the manager in a way, right? And they get you. Well, Adam didn't mess up, but, but there's people that under him, so he's taking the heat. Same here, right? Adam would have taken the heat and he did when he ate, 
that's when original sin hit, and everybody hit. The question, what, uh, since Adam and Eve were not on a fallen state, and right. not subject to concupiscence, yep. why were they vulnerable to temptation? They had free will to do that. So, so this, is, this is the whole happy fall. We don't understand fully why that is the case, but God had given them free will to decide for or against him. Was it a one-time thing? If they had passed that test, would they not have gotten the test? They could have failed? Well, if they would, so if they would have passed the test, right, it would have been eternal life, right? I mean, there would be no spiritual death. There would be no death, disease, destruction. But they would have been, they would have been okay for them, then tempted again later, tempted you following later. I say, you know, why I say no to that. <clears throat> Tell you why, because in the book of Revelation, there's a verse that says that nothing unclean or that shall defile it shall ever enter it again. Right. And what was the first thing that was unclean that defiled, und- that defiled it? It's Lucifer in heaven. And he was cast out, and nothing shall defile it again. So if they would have passed that one-time test, I would say that was it. But I don't know. I, don't, I can't tell you definitively if that was the case. But that's what I tend to think, based on the scripture of Revelation. Mm-hmm. Okay. So is that, is that what they call original justice? What's original justice? Have you ever heard of that? No, <laughs> I've heard of justice. Okay. Well, I've heard of it, and I, I've got something written down about it. And it's, and it's this came from, I believe it came from Jimmy Aiken on Catholic Answers. Mm-hmm. Okay? And he says, had Adam and Eve not sinned, they would have continued in original justice and eventually been confirmed in original justice after a probationary period. They would have access from the tree of life and would have avoided physical death. That's yeah, okay. That, that really is conjecture. Yeah, yeah. Obviously. Yeah. But I have nothing against that. Okay. But I'm just saying, but, and basically, it sort of affirms what I'm saying in a way that they would have originally been in that state anyways right. because it's the one-time test that they failed in heaven. Man is subject to that like that one-time test we failed and now we're in it. Um, <laughs> we're in it. But, but actually, we're, 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 we're redeemed. We're redeemed. Okay, we got redemption, right? This is the, this is the, beauty, this is the beauty of it. But, um, but this is what happened. Yeah, so this is what happened. When, when, when she ate and he ate, that's when their eyes were opened. And what did it go on to say? It said that they knew that they were naked. Here it goes back to the naked and the shame again. And then what did they do? They sewed fig leaves together. So this is going to give me a little hint here, just oh, my own Brian's perception. What was the fruit they ate? What was a type of fruit they ate? What do you think they ate? The apple. Milton coined the apple. Milton was the one that said apple. Yeah, I thought it was the What did they clothe themselves with? <laughs> They're trying to clothe themselves with the same things they fell to. We clothe ourselves with sin. See? Well, that's my Maybe? That's what I'm saying. Okay. I've heard okay. <laughs> <laughs> But this is what I'm saying. That gives me a hint in there because they clothed themselves with figs. So there was a fig tree right there, right? But then, why did they clothe themselves? They clothed, they clothed themselves. Why did they clothe themselves? No, they, because they were naked and ashamed, so they knew. So now the concupiscence hits their eyes. The glory of God faded, gone. Why did the glory of God go? Sin. Can God be in the presence of sin, continue mortal sin like that? Right? He loves you. He upholds you while you're in mortal sin. But you can't share divine life. With more sin. Death, life, they're opposite. Sin, holiness, they're opposite. God's all holy. His glory fled them. His glory lifted, right? So they, they, they saw the sinfulness, right? And they clothed themselves. But what does God do? He comes on the scene and he says, Oh, where are you guys? You know, what are you doing? You know, why are you naked? Who told you you're naked, right? Let us read this. Quite funny, I think, because it is really, it's the humorousness of the beauty of the Father. Right, chastising his children, but in a in a loving way, in a way. Right, we're going to see this. Who told you were naked? God said, "If you were eaten from that tree, I told you not." You think God would have to ask that? Of course, <laughs> of course you do. But, but look at a parent when they're dealing with their four-year-old. I, I I just saw him do that. You asked them. You said, "Did you just take?" You know he did, right? right. Well, why did he do that? God's doing the same thing. He wants you to admit. Right? Yes. He wants you to admit. He's not going to just come right out and condemn. It's you. He wants you to see it. So he says, so did you not eat right, of that tree? And then he said to, and of course, uh, and they, they heard the sound of him saying that. And then the Lord God, uh, after he said, where are you? Did you not eat? He said, who told you you were naked? Because first of all, 
I heard your voice, Adam says, in the garden, I was afraid, and I was naked, I hid myself. But who told you you're naked? Have you eaten from that tree? Then he says, the woman, <laughs> you gave me, did it. Here comes the blame, right? This is what we do. Mm -hmm. The woman did it. No, go to the woman. Why did you, the serpent made me do it. All right, so he goes to the serpent. But look what he do, is doing here, all right? He pronounces some judgments and curses. But notice that the man and woman are never cursed. But who's cursed? The serpent and the ground, right? So it says here, this, he said, the serpent see me. Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all the cattle and more than every beast of the field. And on your belly you shall crawl. That's when he got his sentence. On your belly you shall crawl. That's what people hate snakes, I think, today, right? And you shall eat dust all the days of your life. This is interesting, this dust. Okay. Because... Do you know in the Old Testament, kings were raised from the dust? And the proud were thrown down to the dust. In the Magnificat, Our Lady says, I, She is the lowly handmaid of the Lord. Right? You have cast down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. That image of casting down from the thrones and exalting the lowly is this, right? Is the pride shall be in the dust. And those in the dust who are lowly shall be risen. And man was made from the dust of the ground. And because he's such a splendid creature, God raised him from the dust. The serpent, he puts down to the dust. Man, he lifts up from the dust, right? So he curses him and says, you shall go down to the dust. And then he goes to say that I'll put enmity between you and the woman. Now, what woman is he talking about? Eve? Mary. No. Mary. So this is the test that he failed. Remember I told you, if the devil could say, if I get that woman, who I failed the test to in heaven, then I got his plan foiled. So he thought he had her. Paraphrasing, of course. God comes on the scene, he tells him, says, uh-uh, wrong woman. Yes. No, 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 I tricked you. Big switch thing, right? That you were talking about last week. It was Sam this day. It was um, wrong woman. The woman is Mary. And this verse, chapter or verse 15 of chapter 3, is called the Proto-Evangelium. Proto means first. Evangelium means good news. It's the first gospel. It's the first good news. And why is the word evangelium meaning good news? Because in the middle of that word is angel. And angels bring good news, right? So, so we have, and who brought the good news? The Gabriel brought that news to Mary and shared with her fiat, she accepted. So the first gospel, the proto-evangelium is right there when God says he's got a remedy. He's, getting, he's got a remedy to this, right? I'll put enmity between you and the woman. Between, here's an interesting thing. Jerome translates this in the Latin Vulgate as her seed. Her. Some translate his seed. But it's her surrendering. How can a woman have a seed? Well, interesting, right? Virgin Mary. So it's not Eve. It's the Virgin Mary. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his, you shall, uh, bruise his heel and you will actually crush his head. She'll crush her head. So. The seed is Jesus, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So. The implication here is that enmity is being placed now, right, between the serpent, between the devil, and between the woman. Notice how God does not need to fight against the devil because he created... We're going to talk about this because this has tripped people up, by the way. God created the devil. So if he created everything good and he's all holy, then where did evil come from? It must have been in God somewhere if he's the originator and creator of all things. Wrong. 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 <laughs> I'll tell you. Don't think that way. I don't mean to put doubts in your head. I'm sorry. Because evil is not a created thing. Evil is a privation of something that should be. Just like you really are not created to be blind. If you're blind when you're born, that's a defect. It's not something you're created to do. Right. So because you're blind, it's a privation of what should be. So the devil in his actions is a privation of what should be and suffers the consequence of that. Right. So that's where sin and rebellion come from. Not from God, who can neither be tempted nor tempted, or nor tempt, but from the evil one. Now this enmity is an interesting word. It's not enemy. Now enemy, we think of enemy as really bad, right? It's our enemy. It's yeah. worse. Enmity is a more stronger connotation than the word enemy. Enemy, you can have something in common with, but you're my enemy. But I got something in common with. There's no commonality between Mary and, 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 and the devil. None. Enmity means a complete, total, like 180 opposite. I mean, you're completely the opposite of. This is why the word enmity there is used, right? So it says that 
I will place enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and hers, right? And then she'll crush the head. And this is what we get. By the way, anybody see statues of Our Lady? Right here, right? Yeah. Or up here. You ever notice that most of these statues, she's barefoot, stepping on a snake, yeah. instead of having shoes? Yeah. Somebody said, oh, isn't she afraid of getting bit? No. The reason they portray her as barefoot is because she has no sin, nor can the devil affect her. So he can't turn around. He can try to bruise the heel. I'm going to talk about what bruising the heel means. So he can, he can try to bruise the head, which will crush the head. And she can do it barefoot, saying, your poison is not even going to affect me one iota because I am the Immaculate Conception. Right? Praise the God. So, so what is the bruise? What happened to Christ on the cross? What happened in his flagellation? What happened in the agony in the garden? What happened when he took on sin? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. He's bruising, right? Not crushing. Bruising. And God's using that bruise to redeem us. He was bruised for our offenses, crushed, crushed for our sins, right? But not crushed to death in the spiritual sense, but crushed in the temporal sense, right? But rose, but he had to die. So she, he, so he had you, you had your moments, Satan, and you get your little moments here and there. But your head's going to be crushed, which means the end of you. Bruising, you're just afflicting. Crushing kills it, right? So this is what's happening here in that verse, in that Proto-Evangelium. Then he goes on to say to the woman, I'll greatly multiply your sorrow and in conception and pain you shall bring forth children. Except for a blessed mother. Do you know when Christ was born? The, the, the fathers tell us that there's no pain. Matter of fact, the scriptures tell us that. Before pain even entered, she found herself a child, right? Um, there's no pain when she gave birth to Christ. None. It was seamless. It was beautiful. She matter of fact, her virginity stayed right intact. <laughs> Completely intact because she is perpetually virgin. Why was there no, no pain? Right here, verse 16 tells us, To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow, and in pain you shall bring forth children. That's a judgment for sin. Mary is without sin, right? So every woman has pain in childbirth except for a lady because she is the only one without sin. So the saints tell us that when Christ was born, her virginity was intact and it was like light. Glassing through glass. Think about this. Light of the world is Jesus. He's the light of the world. And as we look at light come through the church stained glass windows, it comes straight through to us, but does not break that glass. She is perpetual virgin, intact, like light passing through glass is how Christ was born, according to the Father. I thought she had pain through the child. Nope, that's, that's, you're talking about pain of Revelation, the book of Revelation. I can't remember where I read it. Oh, I do. <laughs> so, I, I, because I I'll, 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 yeah, I'll, I'll read it to you. Um, because that's a common question, that's why, right? So if you go to Revelation chapter 12, this actually gives the whole scenario of this fall in heaven, right? So Revelation chapter 12 says, Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give right. birth. There's her beautiful. Okay. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about that, right? So the pain is not the physical pain. Mary is at the foot of the cross giving birth to other children. Who are the other children she's giving birth to? You and I. John, behold your mother. Mother, behold your son. At the cross, God is, as she's suffering in her sorrow, that pain is bringing forth the church. Okay. A pain is a necessary. That's pain. right. A pain's not the physical pain is what you're talking it's about, not right? Pain. You, pain you, 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 can, you can suffer pains, right? You, you suffer. The, you miss your loved one. You miss them terribly, but physically you're in great shape. But you have this sorrow in your heart, and this deep, penetrating yeah. sorrow. That's a pain. It's a pain. This is the pain it's talking about in Revelation from Mother Mary. Yeah. So her pain is she's bearing children, and it goes on to say in that same chapter that. She does give birth to the offspring, to those who will believe in Christ Jesus and follow his word. It goes right on to say and define what that pain is. Okay. But in her temporal, physical makeup, there was no pain because there was no sin. And pain is, was the result of original sin to the body of a woman. By the way, when the man fell, the primary defect that he inherited was through his eyes. This is why man looks at people in parts, especially women, parts or pornography or something, because the primary defect's in the eye. When a woman fell, the primary defect that Satan got her was through the ears. He whispers sweet nothings to me. I can go out and gossip to somebody. You know, you think of women, even when men do that, but you think of that, right? Why? Because the primary defect of a woman 
how Satan got her was through the ears. That's exactly what he did. He started dialoguing with her in her ears, even though she was looking at him. Man, when he was created, when, when Adam was created, what was the first thing he saw? God showed him the garden, garden, till it, brought him the animals, name them. So man had this external, outward look of protecting, of guarding, right? Of naming, of, of, of taking dominion. When woman was made, she made from his side, and then God brought the woman to the man immediately. So what's the first thing she saw? Was the relationship. And because of the relationship, women now intuitively have more of, of a understanding and a feel of a relationship than a man does, right? And so what happens is this is why sometimes in marriage, because like, well, you never talk to me, you know, let's talk and let's do this, and let, you know, and he's, his mind's out there, right? So that's, that's, that's intuitive of what happened, right? She was made. She, the first thing she saw was her relationship with Adam. That's not the first thing he saw. This is why he's a hunter and he looks out and he does things, and that's why men are good at war, more so than women, because they can compartmentalize and do the focus task at hand, because that's what Adam was created to do. Look for that enemy, make him his demise, just kill him. Get rid of the enemy, get rid of this, that's why he's supposed to guard and protect. A woman, yeah, she does that, but she can multitask much better because she's relational, right? More relationship no, than man, right? So this, those are the primary defects that hit by the way, I'm not even going to begin to tell you what the others are because I really don't have them memorized. But Father Ripperger, who is a fantastic exorcist and theologian, <clears throat> speaks nine different languages, said that when man fell, when women fell, when, when the woman fell, she inherited five primary defects. One, the main one is through the ears. When man did, he, did, he inherited eight. Eight, and the main one's through the eyes. So <clears throat> this is the sentence. Right, that now they got, and they're living with it. But that's to the woman. What, to the, what does he do to the man? This is what's interesting before I get to the man, though. I'm sorry, I got to do this, and, and we're going to close here very shortly because it's getting close. Your desire shall be for your husband, but he shall rule over you. Now, doesn't that sound nice? It does, right? Your desire shall be for your husband. Oh, what, what, the woman's right. desire shall be for her husband. That's not what it says. It's not what it says. Because, you know, I, I do this because this is how I used to think, right? But this is not what it says. I want you to just listen to this. You don't have to turn there. Just, I, I just want you to listen to this. When Cain fell, when he murdered Abel, God said to him, Cain, sin is desiring you, but you shall overcome it. It lies at its door, and it uses the word desires you, but you shall come. So when God said to Eve, your desire shall be for your husband, it's not the desire in the proper sense of a good, proper sense of desiring. It's the desire to usurp, take control, and to overcome. This is what sin tried to do to add or to, uh, to um, Cain. Cain, God says, sin, read chapter 4. Sin is, lies at your door, its desire is to have you, but you shall conquer it. Eve, your desire shall be for your husband, but he shall rule over you. And guess what we have today? We do have a disorder. We do have a disorder, right? And yes, man's not loving his wife like he should. He should. If he loved his wife the way Christ loves the church, there would be no feminism. Be no feminism. Feminism is a is a is this right here? Is just what I told you. It is this desire for. Their husbands, the desire to assert, not saying against you women, but that's what it is. It's a desire to assert, it's a desire to, to take control and emasculate in a way. Men, men, they're not being men, they're feminine. They let the, what, you just take over, you do it. I don't want to argue, oh my gosh, because I got to put too much into it. That's what happened with Adam. I don't want to argue with this thing. Eve, just give me what you want. Right? And so, boom, down they went. He should have been there and said no to her. You give your wife what she needs, not necessarily what she wants all the time, right? And it's hard for us men to do that, but we have to do that, right? Men should be the head of their household, especially spiritually. They got to pray for their children. They got to take them in. They got to take them to mass. Right now, I'm preaching instead of teaching. But <laughs> this is what this this is what's happening here. It all stems from this chapter. And to Adam. He says, because you've heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I command you not to, cursed is the ground for your sake. And what? And toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Right? So man works himself to death. 
right? and leaves it to his wife who outlives him, right? I mean, isn't that the, isn't that the way it sort of happens anymore, right? Um, in the sweat of your face you shall eat, right? And Adam called his wife's name Eve, and that's where it is, right? And so this is a, a one last thing. I know I'm giving you over, and this is that. I promise you this is that. The very end of that chapter says, The Lord God said, Now will they become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Now let's put out, he's going to put out his hand and take also from the tree of life and live forever. Let me just talk real quick about the tree of life. They sent cherubims to guard that tree of life, kicked Adam and Eve out of the garden. By the way, you know what uh, uh, they say? Um, when I say they, I, I say some of the biblical scholars, not all of them, but some of them say this, is that Adam, or when Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden because of sin, the angel that escorted them out of the garden is the same angel that came to Mary to pronounce, which is Gabriel, to pronounce the Annunciation. Okay? So, because why? Because Eve and Mary have that correlation in the opposite direction, and Adam and Jesus have the correlation in the opposite direction. So it's the same angel that's taking care of one and bringing the news of redemption to the other to solidify the whole picture. Right? So that's what they say. So when they cast them out, they had to put a guard of cherubim. By the way, how many choirs of angels are there? Nine. 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 Yep. Okay, nine choirs of angels. I, you don't have to name them all. I, I do know them all, but you don't have to name them all. <clears throat> what is a cherubim? What choir is that? This is the second highest. Second. Second. Seraphim are the highest. Seraphim are the highest. Second is the cherubim. Now, a cherubim was placed at the, at the cherubim were placed, right, at the, at the tree of life to guard it with flaming sword. Why, why would they have to be guarded? Exactly going back to your question in the beginning. Because now that they have sinned, now that they're in this damned state, so to speak, right, mortally, if they were to reach out, God said it, if they were to reach out and take of that tree of life, they would live forever. But then why did God put the tree of life in there? They could have had that tree of life. But we chose to reject it. Jesus is our tree of life. Do we reject him? A lot of people do. Right? A lot of people do. So the tree of life, actually, in the typology of things, is the cross. And we're going to see the tree of life in the book of Revelation, where the Lamb of God, right, is in the midst of the throne. And there's no need for sun. There's no need for anything in there because, or lamps, because he is the light, right, that will be there. So that is the tree of life. So God's guarding the tree of life by saying, not yet. It's coming. It'll be manifested in time with this woman I'm talking about in the same chapter. It's going to be manifest. This woman, this woman will die. I have enmity between you and her. This is the one that's going to bring forth that tree, right? You can't have it now. You sinned. Jesus is going to restore that tree. He's going to be on the tree, right? And he's the fruit, the fruit of your womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace. He's the fruit, the good fruit, not the fruit, the bad fruit it takes, right? He's the fruit from that tree of life. He's the fruit. So this is the typology the fathers are talking about and how beautiful it is. And that would lead us now into chapter 4, which will be for next week. Any final thoughts or questions? Because I think it's a little past eight. Do you like it so far? Um, it's pretty deep. I, I love Genesis. Um, and it, I, I'm thinking about wanting to continue through the rest of the book somewhere along the line during the year, but I don't know. That's a lot of commitment. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think. See how many of you have your study? Yeah, I can do Leviticus. I can do Leviticus. It's, it's a good book. Genesis is a good yeah. place because Father Rick McGurk is always referring to all of those back to Genesis. It does. Everything goes back to Genesis. Matter of fact, anyone here last week, but Genesis, the Tovadoth in Hebrew, right, means genealogies. And generations come from generating, right? And, and it goes back to Adam, but it means beginnings. Yeah. Beginnings. Yeah, so, so it's the beginning, it's the genealogy, it's the Talada of, of all of our existence. All right, guys, thank you so much. I, I appreciate it. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Brian. Thank you.